Hello, my name is Michael Lambert and uh, today I'm going to talk about the government and I'm going to talk about some of the members of the government. Uh, I should warn you that I'm not going to be entirely polite about them and uh, I think uh, come the end of the video, if you watch to the end, you're probably going to feel quite angry because there is an awful lot to be angry about. Uh, I've been following politics for many years and I have never ever come across such a terrible government. Uh, they, these people are incompetent, they're dishonest, they're unprincipled, uh, they're absolutely useless. And they've already wrecked the country and they're continuing to do so, the wreckage is, is, is continuing. And uh, they're an absolute disgrace, the lot of them. Uh, very many of them, as you, as, you, as you may remember, very many of them were uh, Remainers and yet they all uh, immediately uh, flipped when Johnson told them they had to be in favour of Brexit when they became elected. So we got a cabinet, 21 members of, out of 30 were, were, were in favour of uh, remaining. But they're now all, they're all pro-Brexit because that, that advances their careers. They're a really shabby lot, real second-raters. And of course, top of the pile is, uh, is, is Sunak. He, he became uh, Prime Minister, I think, almost by accident. I think he's probably as surprised as anybody. It's, uh, it's a question of being right place, right time, I suppose. You know, he was... Uh, he was working in the Treasury when uh, Dominic Cummings sacked uh, Sajid Javid and then he suddenly became uh, Chancellor and then along came Covid so he was giving him lots of money and so therefore he became quite prominent, quite popular. And then after the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the spectacle of, uh, of Truss and Kwarteng, he, he uh, ended up being Prime Minister. I don't think he's got a clue. I don't think he's got any stature. He's got no political nous. Uh, he's just a, a wandering, aimless, a grinning uh, a fool really uh, and uh, completely and utterly out of his depth. You only have to see the body language. You saw when 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 Biden came to Northern Ireland and how uh, uh, they had a coffee and, and Biden really treated him like a like a boy, uh, and likewise when in, in Latvia uh, a week before last when they had the NATO meeting. I, I mean, it was embarrassing to watch um, uh, a Sunak running around uh, uh, Biden like a little poodle. I mean, it's pathetic because he, he he knows we're not important, and but Biden's not interested in us anymore. He's interested in America in, in, in the EU. You know, we, we, we have lost all our influence and power in the world. We're not a big respected power anymore or part of a big respected power. And so you get uh, uh, this rather pathetic man uh, running a, a, a cabinet. I think he's afraid of most of them. He's certainly afraid of most of his backbenchers. I mean, he's afraid to come to Parliament to vote and he doesn't want to vote in this, he doesn't want to vote that. He's Normally he's got more important uh, photo opportunities, so he's flying in his helicopter all over the country uh, uh, in order to avoid being in... Uh, in Parliament very often. Uh, 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 he's, he's, he's pathetic. And yet at the same time, he's uh, still got his five pledges, his pledges that start off as pledges and then became promises and now they're priorities. And I think next thing there'll be uh, pie in the sky uh, wishes if uh, if all goes well and uh, we say the right spell. I mean, they're, you know, it's just nonsense. And, uh, and he's still talking about uh, us becoming a worldwide uh, technology superpower and uh, we're going to lead the world in AI and all the rest of it. And I think, as, uh, as a newspaper pointed out the other day, I think it was The Economist, they said uh, uh, um, when it was referring to we were going to become a, a, a green technology superpower, uh, uh, they said uh, uh, the U UK accounts for 2% of global manufacturing and 2% of global R&D. You're not a science superpower if you do 2%. You can't go around claiming that in seven years' time the UK is going to be a climate leader or a leader in green technology. It just doesn't make sense. And of course it doesn't make sense. You know, we're just a small-time power. We desperately, desperately need to work on, on developing our industry and so on, but nothing much is happening. And I'll talk about that in, in, in a moment. Now, last week uh, uh, we had the... Uh, uh, Yesterday, the uh, Somerton and uh, Froome by-election in Somerset, and uh, uh, just by coincidence, uh, two days before it was announced that Tata are going to uh, build a, a battery factory in Somerset. Didn't seem to have much effect on the election, but nonetheless, it was a, 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 a big announcement. And there's all sorts of talk about well, how 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 uh, Tata were persuaded to come here. It's uh, it's generally believed, I think, that they were paid at least five hundred million pounds as a as a bribe. That's five hundred million pounds of our money given to them to come here. They'd come for free if we'd been in, still in the EU. When asked about uh, how much the the, the bribe was, uh, Jeremy Hunt said he couldn't he couldn't say he couldn't say how much of our money we'd given to Tata to come here because that was commercially sensitive. Commercially sensitive is now a code for we, we, we don't want anyone to find out how much we've thrown away of, 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 of taxpayers' money. 
And so uh, the government is almost sort of leaderless, really. I mean, it's just sort of drifting. If anything, it's people like uh, Braverman who are who are running things, who are dictating policy and so on. And, uh, I mean, there's this Horizon project. It's this massive, massive pan-European uh, science research project, which we were part of for however many years it existed until we left the EU. And uh, we were chucked out of it by the EU when we messed around with Northern Ireland. They said, until you sort that out, you can't come back in. So anyway, we've sorted it all out and we, they've said we can come back in. But it does involve spending some money. And, and so instead of going in like all scientists want to do, the science community are desperate to get back in it because it's so important and so valuable to us. But soon it's saying that because there are some backbenchers who might object to us having to spend some money on, on, on being involved. Now, uh, I mentioned just now uh, um, Braverman. Now, she is a really, I don't know, I, I seldom get really angry, but this woman, and, and Patel's the same, and Babadook's the other one, the three of them, I, I, I object so intensely to being patronised by these people. You know, these people are riffraff. And when I get Braveman telling me what the British people want, the British people want the police to have total powers. Uh, the, 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 the British people want uh, for us to stop uh, any demonstrations or have the power to stop any demonstrations. The British people want us to send all these people to, to Rwanda. You know, uh, they're quite crude, these women. Um, I, I'm always concerned about, you say anything about, uh, you know, particular women like Patel Braveman and Beba do you, 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 you love to be accused of being racist. I, I'm not racist. I've never seen any sense in racism. I mean, to, the, to judge someone by the colour of their skin, I mean, it just makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, just just, just nonsense. You might as well judge somebody, uh, prejudice, be prejudiced against somebody because they've got big ears or ginger hair. I mean, it just, just, just makes no sense. But these three do have something in common, uh, and that is that they're all um, daughters of people who came to this country. They all are passionately anti-immigration. Uh, they're all married to white white men, by the way, and they all seem to have this. I think it's some some lack of security, whereby to compensate, they have to be assertive, to be domineering, to be arrogant, to be rude. All three of them so rude. I don't know if you saw Patel. She was, t was speaking in the debate for. Um, on the uh, Privileges Committee report into Johnson lying to Parliament. Uh, she was so rude, so patronising, speaking to the opposition as though they were ch children. This is the way she always speaks to everybody anyway, as though they're the, the, the children. And the woman's an ignoramus. She's just a coarse, crude, horrible ignoramus. And Braverman, she's always talking down to everybody. She's so hostile. It's not necessary. But as I say, I think it's this asserting herself because she has this this lack of inner security, that, 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 this, this, this confidence that... Uh, that she hasn't got. But anyway, uh, uh, you know, regarding this whole immigration thing and, 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 and showing how how unpleasant these women are, uh, it, it, it's a common sort of propaganda to try and whip up some sort of hatred by, by, by demonising certain communities. When Patel was uh, Home Secretary, she talked about the people coming across in the boats and she said that a lot of them were Two of the worst crimes you could ever accuse anybody of, a lot of them were either child rapists or murderers. Now, now of the ten, tens and tens of thousands who've come across in Little Boats, I don't know how many of those have ever been charged with child rape or, or, or murder. And, and where, would she get, where would she get that from? What, what does she have to substantiate that? Nothing at all. It's just a question of demonising them. We can all get them behind them and the Daily Express can talk about them being child rapists and whip up this this horrible victimisation of a, of a minority group. You know, whatever your stance is on immigration, all the rest of it, you know, to victimise, to try for the government, to try and propagandise and to victimise uh, uh, communities, vulnerable communities, is really, really, really unfair. Uh, uh, and Braverman's just as bad. I mean, she talked about uh, gangs of Pakistani men going, Pakistani men going all over the country, abusing children and youngsters. Now, uh, a bit of basic research tells you that of all the cases of child abuse or, or uh, child rape, 
in the UK, uh, less than 16% has been committed by people from Asia, which includes Pakistan. Pakistan is a small part of Asia. So in other words, it's a tiny, tiny minority of all those who are abusing children who are Pakistanis. And yet she wants to put it out there. These Pakistani men, they're all, they're all child rapists, child abusers. And that has such a, it's such a, it's such a damaging thing to put out because it, it kind of sows this sort of cancer that grows as it gets reported on and people start associating those, the, 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 those sort of things, child rape with Pakistani men. And when you look at what Patel and uh, Braven between them have done, telling us all the time that it's what the British people want, it's for our own good. Uh, they made it virtually impossible to, de to demonstrate. Now, any policeman can say that demonstration is too noisy, stop it, and, and that's it, you're breaking the law. Uh, any policeman now, thanks to the uh, uh, recent legislation, can stop and search anybody at will without any reason whatsoever. So if you're walking along the road and a policeman wants to, to, to stop you and take you to take you out your pockets and you hand over your phone and all the rest of it, he's free to do so. And he can take you to the police station and lock you up and he doesn't have any reason to do it whatsoever. It's, just, it's known as a police state. And she's now, Braverman, she's now talking about bringing in anti-terror legislation because we have this great fear of, uh, uh, of terrorism. It's like the fear of, uh, of, of voter fraud. I think there were one or two convictions for voter fraud in the previous general election. And so we had to bring in all this new legislation about photo ID and so on. And now she wants to bring in anti-terrorist anti legislation. I mean, I don't know how many people have been killed by terrorists in the last 10 or 20 years in this country. I did read some of the other day, it was 20 or something. I mean, it's almost none. Then there's the question of the, uh, the prison ships. I mean, they are absolutely desperate somehow or other to punish people who try to come here seeking asylum because they find that they cannot find a way of stopping it. It's unlikely that the Rwanda scheme is going to go through. And so they just want to make it as difficult as possible. And uh, I mean, I saw uh, some plans of these prison ships the other day. There's one parked up in Portland and they're all ready to, to receive prisoners. Yeah, they've got three decks, tiny little cells, and they're going to share two to a cell, little area, rec recreation areas, and that's it. That's where they're going to live indefinitely. You know, I mean, the likelihood that there's going to be mental illness, the likelihood there's going to be violence, there might even be murders on places like that, when you can find so many people in such a thing, just to punish them, because it, it's, it, the, the, these boats only take a few hundred out of the 100,000 that are waiting, 170,000 who are waiting for, for, for the Home Office to make up their mind whether or not they can stay. And, and something else I'd like to ask, and I don't know if anybody knows this, if you might put it in the comments if you do, it's been widely reported that the contract for these uh, three prison ships is 1.6 billion. Given to an Australian company, because obviously any big government projects we give to foreigners, like uh, railways and, and water and gas and electricity, all foreigners for us, we, we, we don't want to make any profit ourselves. So it's been given to an Australian company. And uh, it's said to be 1.6 billion, it's widely reported. Now 1.6 billion is for 2,000 uh, inmates, 2,000 prisoners for two years. Now that, by my calculations, works out at about 800,000 pounds per, per person for the two years. And, and I just don't uh, believe that can possibly be right. But if anybody knows, I'd be, I, I, I'd be interested to know, please. Now, uh, 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 Braverman has a little puppy dog, a little uh, a little lap dog uh, called uh, Robert Jenrick, Honest Bob. Honest Bob, who you, you you will know, he's become very famous because of the the murals lately. And uh, I, I, I was thinking the other day, you know, this this whole thing about the murals. When it when it blew up, he was a bit embarrassed about it, and he said uh, he'd had them painted out because uh, they were uh, age inappropriate. In other words, if you know, men were coming there, then they wouldn't be interested in Mickey Mouse. Turned out that the average age, average age of the people going, the children going to that uh, the, 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 the centre, uh, reception centre, was 14. In other words, 50% of them were less than 14 years of age. Now, it seems to me and seems to almost anybody that Mickey Mouse cartoons are appropriate for children of 14 years of age or under. But that's how he got out of it. 
And you keep hearing him when he's interviewed talking about, uh, you know, conditions are too comfortable for people. That's why they have to move out of hotels and they're going to put them in these very basic barracks and so on. And uh, uh, I mean, you can see how he really wants to, to make life difficult. I, I think he thinks that's the way to uh, deter people from coming. And I just thought about how cruel it is to actually want to punish children. I mean, these children that come here, I mean, either they've been sent by their parents or maybe their parents have been killed or whatever, but they're pretty desperate. And when they get here, I mean, especially under 14, can you imagine how terrified they must be? Yeah, it must be absolutely horrendous. And he gets this country and he wants to make them unwelcome. I think if he could actually hurt them, he probably would. If he could make their lives miserable, he would. And I thought back to, you know, we've all heard, we read, read recent history about how people have committed great acts of uh, atrocity against other minorities and, and been really, really nasty. And they, they, they have to go home at night with their family. And you think to yourself, how can somebody be that nasty and, and possibly have a normal family life like anybody else? And it just happened that I was looking for a, a picture of Jenrick for my thumbnail. And I found this page full of pictures, and there's one picture there of Jenrick, and he's, uh, he's with his three children, three daughters, all quite young. I should think they're probably about somewhere between six and ten or something. Beautiful girls, absolutely lovely. They're all sort of around his, uh, his legs, and he's, he's laughing, and they're laughing, and it was, uh, you know, it's a lovely family photograph of really, you know, really happiness. And I thought... There's this guy, he wants to make these sad, pathetic children that come from all these terrible countries where they've suffered all sorts of terrors. He wants to make them miserable. And yet at the same time, he will absolutely adore his children. And there will be his life, they'll have everything throughout life. They'll have all that money can buy. I just thought, how do you, how do you reconcile that? How can you on the one hand be so vicious, and so nasty? And yet at the same time be a nice, loving father. Now on the subject of the uh, the Rwanda thing, I reached something which is quite interesting. I only found this yesterday, and it's um. This is part of our agreement. Now you know we've paid 140 million pounds to to the Rwandans to accept our our uh, refugees. And. Uh, we're just waiting for the Supreme Court to decide whether or not we can go ahead. Now, this is a quote from the deal we've got with them, and it's uh, quote number 16, or paragraph 16, resettlement of vulnerable refugees. 16.1. The participants will make arrangements for the United Kingdom to resettle a portion of Rwanda's most vulnerable refugees in the United Kingdom. Got that? We're going to select whoever we like of these people who come to the UK from all these terrible places. We're going to select a portion of them. We're going to send them to Rwanda, punishing them to deter others, dump them in Africa. And on the return plane, they're going to fill it up with Rwanda's most vulnerable refugees, not just ordinary refugees, the most vulnerable. Now, most vulnerable seems to me there'd be people who are disabled, mental illnesses, violence problems. In other words, all the ones that they want to get rid of. So this deal is a deal to send asylum seekers in the UK to Rwanda and swap them for African vulnerable refugees. I mean, it's insane. It is absolutely insane. I don't think many people realise this is, this is, this is the deal. It's, no, it's a portion of Rwanda's. Maybe we'll take back more than we send. And it's all to fulfil this insane, psychopathic, mad woman, Braverman's obsession with seeing planes taking off for Rwanda. These people are running the country. These people are wrecking our country. Then there's Babadook, or Badenhop. As I've said before, the only way we're going to solve our problems is by expanding the economy by expanding economic activity because that's the only way you generate wealth that you can tax to pay for all the things you need to pay for. So that is the absolute priority to get the economy going. And that should be the absolute focus of government. 
But this government under, under, under Sunak, it's not even enough, that job of doing, reviving the economy, not even, it's not even enough for one person. It, it, I'm sorry, it's, it's too much for one person. So, so Babadook is only half doing that, and the other half she's dealing with women's interests. And she went off to, uh, to New Zealand with her uh, trade and industry hat on to sign the CPTPP deal. And she was interviewed on the television, you might have seen it last weekend, from Australia. Now, this deal will add approximately 1.8 billion to our GDP in 10 years' time, if all goes well. Leaving the economy cost us 100 billion. So it's 1.8% of what we've lost by leaving the EU, which we'll gain from this deal with CPTPP. In fact, uh, we already had free trade deals with uh, uh, 10 of the 11 countries in the CPTPP, so we just got one more country out of it. And as the, uh, the wonderful Sophie Ridge uh, pointed out on, uh, on her programme last week, she said um, the deal of 1.8 billion compares with uh, uh, the value of the Manchester City football team, which is 5 billion. In other words, this is a third of the value of the uh, Manchester football team, Manchester City team. Daily Express headline all over the page 12 trillion trade boost see we only our, our entire gdp is 2 trillion so it's going to go up six times according to them and the readers will read it and they'll believe it 12 trillion that is the total gdp of all the 11 cptpp countries and i tell you what if you look at the bookies the next person to become leader of the conservative party and potentially prime minister if anything happens to sunak Babadook. I mean, you can't believe it. And when she was being interviewed by uh, uh, Lauren Koonsberg on Sunday, I, she was so aggressive. She knows everything. Rude, aggressive, horrible woman. Just like, like Braverman. She's running the country. Then there's Therese Coffey, the cage fighter from Lancashire. Beer swelling, cigar chomping. T-shirt stained lump. She's uh, Secretary of State for DEFRA, looking after the environment and various other things. And of course, water comes under her, under her. She was on Sky News a short while ago. Now, bear in mind that. Uh, now that we've left the EU, there's no penalty from the EU for us to tip sewage in the uh, in the rivers and the sea, and, and we all know that we sold all our uh, uh, our water companies very cheaply to foreigners, and those foreigners then said, "Oh, we've got lots of assets here. Let's go and borrow loads of money." They borrowed lots and lots of money. They paid it all themselves in dividends, and they got into a lot of debt. And the pump, water companies haven't got any money, and uh, in order to do that, partly they didn't spend much money on on on, on uh, our renewing uh, infrastructure and so on. So what they do now, because it's cheaper and it's profitable, and they can't afford to do anything else anyway, is just chuck it all in the in the rivers and the seas. And the whole world knows that we are a filthy, dirty, disgusting country now that sticks all its rubbish, its, 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 its excrement into the sea. This is, this is Therese Coffey. That's Therese with two, two French accents, which she doesn't actually use, but they're there to decorate her name to make her look sophisticated. This is what she said. Our bathing waters are cleaner than ever before. See? 300,000 times last year, water companies tipped sewage into the waters all around the coast. And she says they're cleaner than ever before. You see, they just lie. This is an insult to her. And this bolshy, bolshy woman, she has do, she won't take any truck from anybody. What she says is right and that's it. There's no argument with her. Oh, no, no. Everything she says is right. She went on to say, the water is cleaner than it was in 2010. You see, in 2010, it was, it was uh, the Labour Empire. The water is now cleaner. 300,000 uh, instances of sticking sewage in the, in its, in, in the sea, it's got, it's got cleaner. She says, so 93% of our bathing waters are excellent or good. And that's an increase from about 70% with Labour in power in 2010. I mean, how dare they? How dare they? The utter incompetence of these morons. And I haven't even got time to go on about uh, other pond life, like like like, like Shaps, who on 
on on on, uh, on Twitter. He described himself as the, the right honourable Grant Shops MP. Or, or Oliver Dowd, and, or Greg Hans, he's the chairman of the Conservative Party. If you read his tweets, they're like like the tweets of an eight-year-old. They are so childish. He he put up a copy of that note that Liam Byrne left when the Labour left the last in, in, in 2010, saying there's no money left. He's still p- posting that on Twitter. These people are so bad, the standards are so low. And of course it's all because Johnson eliminated anybody who had any, any, any character, any, uh, uh, any principle. All, all, all the people who uh, uh, believed in, uh, in, in Remain, they were all chucked out. And I haven't got time to mention Owen Patterson, the guy who was taking £100,000 salary a year from a, a, a firm for whom he was lobbying in Parliament, Radox. Neil Parrish, he's the guy who was found looking at pornographic pictures of tractors in Parliament. Dominic Raab, 24 accusations of uh, uh, bullying. Hang on, hung on, hung on, hung on, didn't he? He eventually had to go. Nadim Zahawi, he forgot to pay 3.5 million in tax. I mean, we can all do that and it's a very easy mistake to make. There's one MP. He's been arrested for rape, accused of rape. He's been bailed four times in a year. Four times on bail. He hasn't been seen in Parliament for a year. I bet he's drawing salary. Nobody's allowed to mention him. But do you know what? His local party have reselected him. He might be doing 20 years for rape by the time he gets elected. There's another MP, a guy called Andrew Rossendell. Hadn't been seen in Parliament for a year. There's Nadine Dorries. Hasn't been seen in Parliament for a year. She joined, they're both drawing 88,000 a year. Dorries is apparently paying her daughters, two daughters paying the secretaries, 45,000 a year each. Then there's Lord Gormless. Remember Lord Gormless? Probably the stupidest man that's ever, ever set foot in, a, in the Cabinet Office. Completed under Dimwit. He's writing every week in the Telegraph, utter rubbish, he writes, giving his opinions as if anybody on earth could give a damn about Lord Gormless's opinions. Total failure in life. The guy who, you again, find it all over Twitter, pictures of him uh, as uh, chairman of the Whiskey Foundation saying how important it was that we should stay in the, in the EU. And then he went off again like a little puppy dog to do. Johnson's dirty work and uh, in the, with, 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 with the withdrawal agreement, and, and as for the the, 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 the just uh, rubbish people like uh, uh, Gullis and, and, and Anderson and, and various others, and of course I haven't even mentioned Hancock as well with all his uh, PP deals. This government is a government of complete and utter second-rate rubbish. Not even second-rate, third-rate rubbish. They're a disgrace, and, and not only that, they are just destroying this country. And there doesn't seem to be anything to do about it. And we just have to put up with it. Utter, utter incompetence. Now they're off for six weeks. I mean, heaven knows what will happen in six weeks' time because our economy, as we all know, is going down and down and down and the cost of living is going up. Interest rates aren't going to come down. Businesses are, and so many businesses must be just hanging on. Can't even go for a swim in the sea. You know, I mean, it's just, just ridiculous. But, um, but anyway, there we are. Anyway, if you've watched that far, thank you very much. And if you haven't already subscribed, or if you know anybody you think might be interested in what I have to say, I'd be most grateful if you'd, uh, if you'd pass, uh, pass on my name. And uh, so until then, thank you very much for watching, and uh, bye for now.